Welcome all and thank you for joining today's AWRI webinar. My name is Robin Dixon and I'm a senior viticulturist at the AWRI. In the spirit of reconciliation, the AWR acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people today. I would like to acknowledge Wine Australia for providing funding and support for webinars via the AWRI Extension Project. So in this session, we'll look at advances in scale control. But before we jump in and make a start, a couple of reminders for anyone who's new to AWRI webinars. If you would like to provide a comment or ask a question during the session, click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom toolbar, type in the question and click send to send it through. So you can do that anytime throughout the webinar. We will be holding the Q&A sessions at the end, um, but please throw your questions to us at any time. A reminder also that this session is being recorded and a link to the recording via our YouTube channel will be sent to you after the webinar. So for anyone who has just joined, welcome. Today's webinar topic is advances in scale control. And it's great pleasure to welcome Dr. Paul Cooper from the Australian National University and Jenny Venus from Brad Case Contracting. So first up, we're going to hear from Dr. Paul Cooper. So Dr. Paul Cooper undertook his PhD at UCLA and held four postdoctoral positions before being appointed as a lecturer at ANU in 1987. Paul is the editor in chief for the Australian Journal of Zoology and has worked on various aspects of feeding in insects, including several papers on biology of phylloxera and scales on grapevines. So Paul, if you're ready, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Robin. Um, I'm going to... Um deal with some of the work we've been doing recently on the uh, control of scales and the potential for using uh, various grapevines uh, cultivars as their uh, a control mechanism. So the focus is just that we've seen differences amongst the cultivars on the distribution of scales, both within and between vineyards. And that leads us to the specific questions is how do scale numbers differ among cultivars raised in a greenhouse under the same conditions? Because vineyards, and even within a vineyard, you can have quite differences in terms of the, the environments. And then with that, how do the cultivars then respond to the presence of scales, um, both in growth and other aspects? So just to remind people what we found previously, is that there are various huge differences that we can see across cultivars. For example, Pinot Noir has almost no scales on it. Chauvignon Blanc has an early presence of scales, but then it reduces quite dramatically. In contrast, you have both Chardonnay and Riesling having a very large number of scales. Why can this, how can this happen? And what's the mechanism? First of all, part of it is that scales feed on the leaves. And we see that here, there are a number of scales present. Many of them are associated with the uh, veins um, or the uh, vessels of the leaves. Amads are actually out in the middle of the leaf. They're feeding we think on parenchyma cells, um, which are the large cells um, just underlying the uh, uh, epidermal cells. Um, although we can never be positive exactly because of local localization of where they're feeding. We do know that their feeding differs along the patterns of the presence of the scales on the different cultivars. 
So what we see here is a leaf chemical analysis from the leaves of a variety of cultivars, then mainly the Syrahs group, and then Grenache and Pinot Noir. Now that corresponds to the resistant and to the susceptible cultivars that we saw in the general pattern in vineyards. But we don't know what that is and we don't know what it means in terms of the uh, actual uh, feeding control or the limitation on the population of the scales as a result of the chemicals within those leaves. So what we do is we set up a complete Latin square design which um, for 24 vines um, of each cultivar. We do the experiments where half of, the, half of our, are infected with uh, scales and half are not. And that allows us then to compare resistant and susceptible plants within the same greenhouse at the same time using a infected, non-infected response. For the leaf analysis, we collect the leaves, um, not near where we put the scales. In fact, remote from the, as far as we can get away. So we're looking at actually the response of the plant, not directly associated with the scales. I put them in paper bags, immediately freeze them in a dry shipper, um, then put them in a uh, minus 80 until I can use the freeze dryer. And then I just take the leaves and crumple up with the, within the bags and then weigh out about half a gram into uh, GCMS vials and then seal them. In order to understand what the volatiles or those compounds which may be associated with those leaves, we then take the vial, put them on a uh, into a GC mass spec, which is fitted with a solid phase micro extraction system. And basically what it is, it's a needle which goes into the vial, samples the headspace, and then that those chemicals which are sampled are released by temperature into a gas chromatograph, and then um, determine what the compound is by mass, spectro by mass spectrometer. We use various standards and then also libraries of these, which makes it much easier to determine what the compounds are coming off the different cultivars in response to either the having scales or not having scales. So now I'm gonna go through a couple of experiments that we've, we've done. The first one is on a comparison of a white grape variety, Chardonnay, with the other white grape variety, the Chauvignon Blanc. Now, Chauvignon Blanc had some characteristics of resistance from that first characteristic, first graph that I showed you. Well, Chardonnay showed that it, in fact, was relatively susceptible to scales. The first thing is that control plants are not dissimilar, and neither are the infected plants. So in other words, the only real difference that we're seeing here is whether the scales were put onto the plant or not. So Chauvignon Blanc is not showing a resistance, at least in the greenhouse response. But we do see some very interesting results in terms of the plant response itself. So this is a Chardonnay, and this is a Chauvignon Blanc with scales on it. And what you see is a huge difference in terms of the shoot for Chauvignon Blanc, the root for Chauvignon Blanc, but not much of a difference for shoot or root for Chardonnay, whether they're infected or not. The shoot root ratios indicate that in fact, that growth is proportional. So both root and shoot increase. 
in response to the scales. And the ratio does not change. Now from the leaf, so that gives us one big question. What could be stimulating the growth of the Sauvignon Blanc in response to the presence of scales? Well, this is now a principal component analysis of the chemicals which we're measuring in the leaves. And all that does is give us an overall view or do we see changes in either one of these cultivars in the presence of scales? And although we see a very clear separation between Chauvignon Blanc and Chardonnay, the change with respect to infection is minimal. So we don't see a big overall change in the chemistry. But we do find specific chemicals which do change. And this is now a taking the principal component analysis and looking at the scores we're looking for compounds which have a very high influence on the distribution of that principal component analysis. Now we see that there are several compounds here which play a role, but the ones I wanna concentrate on are the ones that either show a change in sign between Sauvignon Blanc and Chardonnay or a change in the overall value of their response. <clears throat> the biggest change is actually associated with benzyl alcohol. But we do see that none and all has a change in sign as does phenol to meth. Now those are both associated with a pheromone for insects or an insect repellent. So it does look like there is some specific chemicals which are changing in association with the presence of the scales. The benzyl alcohol is of interest because this is part of the methyl salicylate or the salicylic acid pathway in plants. And salicylic acid pathways are known to respond to sucking insects. And that sucking insects will change the contribution of carbon to various defenses and or growth. And we think this is very important for what's happening with the Sauvignon Blanc. So if I just take out that benzyl alcohol and actually report it in terms of nanograms per gram of plant, we can see that in Chardonnay, there's very little change between infected and uninfected plants. But when it's Sauvignon Blanc, there is a decrease in the amount of benzyl alcohol present. And we believe this is indicating that carbon is being moved from defense into growth. And that's what's causing that stimulation of the plant that we see in that growth pattern. <clears throat> now, the nanonol and the phenol may be actually associated with secondary responses, either bringing in ladybird beetles, and this is a ladybird beetle larva fe that feeds on the scales themselves, or may be associated with the presence of Metaphycus helvolus. 
which is a specific scale parasite. And here you can see the parasitic larvae in an adult female. These are adult females from which parasitic larvae have eaten their way out. And you can see the holes where they leave behind when they eat their way out. And then these are the adult metaphycus themselves, which have emerged after pupating on top of the female and then are present for mating. Now, the reason why we think this is a, a, a potential uh, control process is because the eggs are laid in the scale larvae in first and second early instars, which are present around January, February. And then the larvae actually undergo a winter, what you could call a, meta, a, a winter um, a delay in development just like the larvae of the scales themselves do, and then complete their uh, development into adults in spring, just after the scales become active. And so then they start laying their eggs into the scales in that early springtime before you have any damage or production of um, large quantities of honeydew, which leads to sooty mold. <clears throat> now that process we think is completely different in red grape varieties. So the red grape varieties that we know are resistant are Pinot Noir, um, Cabernet Sauvignon, and potentially Merlot, but we haven't actually looked at that in any detail. And what we have is when we have infected plants, you get some areas where we put the scales on, the leaves start turning red. Now that red color leads to the death of the leaf, but it's not like most diseases which cause the leaves to turn red. As you can see, the petioles have red, and we believe it's anthocyanin, although we can't be positive. That's one of the things I'm doing this year, which leads bringing the material, the anthocyanin, potentially from a remote area, not from the leaf itself. Most diseases which cause leaves to turn red, the anthocyanin is produced directly within the leaf. So this is unusual. Now we know that occurs in Cabernet Sauvignon as well. But what's interesting is when we raise Shiraz in the same greenhouse with Cabernet Sauvignon, Shiraz shows that same response. And normally it does not. So now we're pretty much sure that in fact, it's some type of volatile chemical which is being released by Cabernet Sauvignon in response to scales which is inducing that same response in Siraj. Now, why is this useful? Well, again, what we see is that controlled plants have almost no scales, while the infected plants have lots of scales. But now we find that the, where the scales are differs on the two plants. So the scales tend to accumulate on the red leaves of Shiraz. Well, they move on to the green space off the red leaves in Cabernet. Now, what, why is this important? Well, the red leaves in both plants are dying and eventually gets abscised. So what you're doing by transmitting the volatile produced in Cabernet Sauvignon 
inducing the leaves to turn red in Shiraz means that the scales which are present on those leaves are going to be dropped off the plant as those leaves are abscised. So you're removing a large load of scales simply because of that difference in the two responses of the scales on those plants. Now, just as in the Pinot Noir, we sure again see again that it's the petiole which turns red first, and then the red tends to go out. And you can see that many of the vessels, the red before it actually gets into the leaf it's, so itself. And at least in these cases, it may be one way of controlling scale numbers. The idea of this year's work is to determine what that is and see if we can induce it into Siraj, which is not present in the greenhouse, so that we can do this in an area such as what may be occurring in the field. So in summary, we know that different cultivars have different response to the presence and feeding of scales. That we know vol volatile chemicals from certain cultivars may attract be various beneficial insects and that it can have influences on growth and development of the plants themselves. And that at least in the red grape cultivars, they appear to use anthocyanins to control scales. And that may change both leaf palatability or whether the scales like it or not, but definitely the leaf viability. Now, this work has obviously not been just done by me. I've had lots of help all the way through. And we have Nelson Simbikin, who was my first PhD student, who did some work out in the field and saw the patterns that we were observing in the field. Angus Hayes, who is an honor student, Lydia Murphy, who's done the most recent work on the Cabernet and um, Shiraz differences. Kevin Powell, who got me into this completely when we were starting work on the uh, phylloxera. And then for statistics, Robert Forrester and Te Teresa Neiman. And then also all the managers and owners who would let me walk around on the vineyards and steal things like leaves and grapes and other things which are useful for doing the work. And I wouldn't be able to have done that without all their help. This is where I'd like to um, mention Leo of Mount Madura. He has been most patient with me um, and has made it very easy for us to do, get, get to where we are. So thank you. And I'll turn that now over to Jenny. Oh, thank you. Um, that was a super interesting presentation. I'm sure lots of questions will be flying your way. Um, but now I'd like to introduce Jenny Venus. Get out of so, stop, stop share. So Jenny is uh, currently working for Brad Case Contracting. So Jenny has worked in the viticulture industry for more than 20 years. Uh, she is a viticulture consultant with Brad Case Contracting, addressing viticulture issues ac across South Australia. Jenny was awarded the Viticulturist of the Year Award for Langhorn Creek in 2021. Congratulations, Jenny. Um, she has a keen interest in vineyard pests and diseases and their control, in particular scale insects and their impact on vine health and virus spread. Jen, if you're ready, I'll yep. hand over to you. Lovely. Thank you. Hopefully everyone can see my um, slides. So they're all good to go. Robin hasn't said otherwise. So really, we're going to make a fairly dramatic shift from a really um, technical side of things that it's fantastic that Dr. Cooper's um, continuing to do that work um, over in Canberra. So really what I'm going to focus on fairly quickly um, because I think the question time really is the critical part of this presentation today where we can sort of try and nut out a little bit more around scale, is just 
what we need to consider when we're thinking about scale control and what gaps we have in our knowledge that can then feed back into the research organisations to um, you know, pursue some of those major gaps that we really have in our knowledge base. So um, really what I'm going to do is, is probably look at a, um, the ways that we've currently got to control scale. Um, I will present some information around um, insecticide selection, but really I want to make that very clear that, um, you know, I'm just giving some general advice as they say, and that, you know, um, at the end, we can chat about that. But um, so there will be a, a small section or a section throughout this around where we may position the insecticides that we currently have and where we'll position those better. But really you need to think about your vineyard in particular when you're selecting um, insecticides, if that is the way you're going to go. So really when I think about a strategic management for anything, whether that's powdery mildew downy or um, scale in this case, you know, we used to talk about the three T's, I talk about the five T's, we need to know what the target is, the timing, the technique, the treatment and the tracking of that. So that's sort of what I'll cover fairly briefly today. Obviously the target is scale. We need to make sure that the target is scale, that it's not mealybug, we can deal with mealybug fractionally different. Um, so it's really important that we know what the target is and that we're addressing the problem that we, we really know what that problem is in our vineyards. Um, and so I think I'll progress on from this slide. So obviously scale, I think I've shown enough slides now and, and Dr. Cooper's shown some around um, the scale that we're dealing with, what it looks like in the vineyard. And towards the end, I'll show some more photos around monitoring that and what you might be looking for at different times. So, you know, these are um, mature females. As we say, there's not much room left in the the motel there, it's pretty full. Um, this is a fairly severe case. Um, and we're still really coming to grips with what number of scale do we need in the vineyard to, to treat and when does it become a problem? So, you know, all the work that we've done um, and, and a lot of that was done by Dr. Cooper in identifying what scale we have. We really um, think we have two dominant scale in South Australia and probably the same along the Eastern seaboard. And we're getting some more feedback out of Western Australia that they're popping up there as well. Um, that we have what we call the grapevine scale, which is this top one, um, a long brown um, scale, and then we have frosted scale. So they're, they're the two that we really have in South Australia. Um, does that matter? Um, probably for us as viticulturalists and vineyard managers, um, they both behave fairly similar in the vineyard. So what we need to know is that we have scale rather than merely bug or something else causing that sort of mold. Um, the critical thing for us in controlling anything is, is looking at the vulnerable parts of the life cycle. So, because that is where we can target weaknesses within the insect, within its life cycle. So where, where are we at the moment? Most of us are out there looking at vineyards, seeing what's going on. We've passed this phase. You can see this photo here from 15. I've got thousands of photos. You know, they tend to be pretty similar in their dates. Um, this was probably fractionally later for us this year. I'm out in vineyards now and we're at this phase where we've moved from um, overwintering, which is this number five, where they sit well protected in under the bark on spurs. We get to that sort of warming of weather in spring, they start to grow rapidly and then um, maturing now. Um, so now we're at this phase where we wait for eggs to be laid. So if we're lifting those out in the vineyards and I'll show that a bit later on, the, the, the eggs are under there. Um, Dr. Cooper showed a little while ago, and I don't have that slide in here, that you know it takes about um, at 20 degrees, and, and he might comment on this in the open question section, around that 20 days to hatch. Um, so that gives us a little bit of monitoring information there. Um, the vulnerable phase, so we've got to get from here to this phase here when they're hatching really for control. Um, so this sort of happens for us generally around flowering, then they, uh, that's when they're very mobile, they'll start running, you see them running along wires, and then they settle on the backs of leaves. Um, down at the bottom, 
sit there most of the season feeding, creating that honeydew, which is a problem for you at the end of uh, at vintage. Um, once we start picking, there must be, and, and Dr. Cooper might talk a little bit about that, a change in seems to drive them back or the leaves start falling and they move back um, onto those spurs. So that's, that's the beast we're sort of dealing with. Um, I don't think I've got a slide here. We do get a lot of discussion, um, you know, around how many generations we have a year. That's probably something that, that maybe still is a gap because there's a, a difference between whether one scale has several generations um, or whether they're just not in sync. So that we've got each scale only has one generation, but they're all out of, they're not all running at the same race, I suppose. So some will lay, go from here now, some may do that later in the year. So at, at vintage, we, we think there's maybe more than genera one generation. Still a whole lot of work to be done around that biology of the scale and what's really happening in the paddock put it into something more of what um, we deal with, I'm just keeping track of time here, um, we deal with in the paddock as viticulturalists, you know, what, what we want to know is, is how do we control it? because they're having a major impact in the vineyards around that um, vine decline, vine health, virus spreading, uh, fruit quality, botrytis impacts with that because they're feeding and, and creating a wound. So what we're really focused on is, is what we can do currently. So if we look at a timeline of grape growing in the paddock, and, and I'll go into this chemistry, as I said, a little bit more um, around our most accepted products um, by our industry at the moment are these three. Um, and I might flick back to this one. So we've got Applaud, um, that's been in the market for a fair while, Movento, Travor, and then I've put up here maybe some of these pesticide oils. So I might go forward and then just skip back to this slide and we can, um, I can discuss it a little bit further for you. So if we look at chemical control, when I first started this work back in 2010, uh, 11, sorry, it would have been, um, some of these products weren't available then, but really, the main products are these ones in yellow. We do have others, um, you know, chlorpyrifos was used, but really that's not the way we want to go with broad, broad spectrum insect. Uh, we've had seasons where we've put out a lot of winter oils and, and um, paraphernetic oils over winter to try and manage them um, in that winter space. Obviously, many of you would have heard about the clothed and the samurai treatments that we did and, and the issues we come up with that. And really, you know, given that it's a group 4A and the impact um, internationally around using neonicotides, we've moved away from that as well. So we're really left with, if we look at the dog book in particular, um, and obviously your um, winery spray diaries is where you would be looking. Um, you know, we, for scale control, we really only have Travor, Movento and the oils. And down here for Mealybug, we have applaud. Um, and we do know that that has some impact. And I'll go back to that other slide for um, scale control. So really that's what is listed and what we can use. And then interestingly, you know, in, um, I'll just flip back, you know, the problem we've got here is this timing. And, and we'll talk about that in the growth stage. So Movento, we've got up to EL18, Travor up to 19, uh, applaud here a little bit later. We do have these oils sit here um, under powdery mildew. And I'm really interested this year that this is certainly only trial work, um, looking at whether we can maybe use some oils later in the season. Um, Obviously, we have to avoid phyto and things like that, but that's some trial work that we're, I'm looking at doing um, this year. So we're quite limited around what, um, what we can use. So if we go back, um, where do we step? So we do have, um, as I said, applaud up to this point, just to make it quite clear before I move through the chemistry of these um, chemicals. Travor up to that EL19. So we've got an opportunity through here and Movento, a quite small window, and you'll see why when I go through that label. Um, 
maybe the oils, there might be some opportunity up here later, but that really is trial work. Um, the main oils were then used obviously um, after harvest or really through the infancy phase. So really we are quite restricted in what we can do um, and where our products can be used. And if you think about what I said around the life cycle, you know, most of them are hatching right on that flowering, which is when you go through what the products are, we'll understand why. Um, so if we flick through, I thought it would be good just to revisit chemistry. Um, really, um, you know, I've worked in all sorts of um, facets of the viticulture industry and, and often a product comes out, it's sort of put on the market, there's a lot of publicity around it and then uh, it sort of dies down a little bit and we sort of start using it how we use it. So I thought it would be good really to address these products and try and get the most out of these products that we can because this is all we have to use currently. So if we look at Trevor um, as the first product that I'm going to discuss, there are some um, uh, uh, always check your company's radar. Um, Trevor is an interesting mix of a group 7C, which is this uh, paraproxen, which is an insect growth regulator, and um, the um, neonicotide. neonicotide. Um, so we have a, a dual chemistry there. And I think that is something that we really need to think about how we use that dual chemistry better in our spray programs. If we look at um, the critical comments of what the label allows us to do, um, obviously it says EL31 on the label, but we know clearly that that's 19. It does for us say that it needs to be applied as a dilute high volume spray. So when you're going out spraying these, the critical thing about this is making sure we get really good coverage, um, that we're not limiting the ability for these products to hit the insect. It also really says that we need to be addressing the onset of crawlers. So obviously for us, um, the timing there is fractionally out. So how can we address this a little bit better and use these products better? Um, we'll just go back, sorry. If we look at what each of these chemistry does, um, the group seven, the paraproxifen, is a growth regulator. So it's really trying to stop that small um, crawler from developing through and maturing. So that's why we're hitting that um, crawler phase. But the other thing that is interesting around this product is that um, it can disrupt egg laying and egg hatching. Um, and it keeps the young from growing. So maybe there's an opportunity to use this product at that um, early phase when the scale before they mature as a female, um, when they're quite vulnerable before they get that hard hatching. The neonicotide part of this is very quick acting. Um, so if we can hit those scales, there may be a opportunity to really use this product earlier before they lay. Um, so maybe we need to think about this more critically where we use um, Travor in our spray program rather than thinking it's, it's withholding L19, so I'll wait and use it there. It needs to be contacted. It does move through the leaves, but we've got to get coverage. Um, if I move on to Applaud, Applaud came out um, probably one of the first products for Mealybug that we saw. It was used late, didn't work well, and we sort of dropped it. Um, I think it probably is something that can be reincorporated into our programs. If we think we have a limited number of products, the last thing we want to do is induce resistance in um, the population because we're only using one chemistry. So it's important to think about rotating through these chemistries as well. Um, so if we look at um, Applaud, it's, it's similar to that group seven in that it's a um, it's different group, but it's still a growth regulator. So works differently on the scale, impacting on molting. But once again, it's got this really interesting phase of it that um, treated insects lay sterile eggs. So once again, maybe rather than where we initially used it, which was late on those crawlers, maybe we can bring it forward and use it on those developing scale so that the eggs that they're laying um, aren't viable 
So, you know, really thinking about the chemistry where we put it, um, it's contact. So if we think about the size of our canopy early, we've got far more, more opportunity more leaving this product to EL to 80% cap for EL25, EL23 when the canopies are big. There is some vapor activity with it, slow acting persists. So, and it's soft on beneficial. So, you know, I think there may be we need to think about this product in our programs, whereas it was really probably used at the wrong time, um, maybe at lower rates, and we didn't get the impact that we were really looking for. The third one um, that is in our toolbox currently is Movento. Movento um, can be used up to EL18, uh, a very systemic product, um, but once again, it has a very limited window. The critical comments on the label here say that we need to wait till we've got some leaves, EL13, and we have to have it sprayed by EL18. Movento needs um, really good sap flow for it to move through. So, um, and it works once again on those crawlers. And it is quite specific about working on those crawlers. So it's probably not a product we wanna move around so much. Um, we really need to hit that right growth stage for it. Um, I think probably the mistake that was made a fair bit with um, Movento was because it is so systemic, the rates that it was sprayed at were reduced. Um, but what we really need to make sure we do is get fantastic coverage with it, a lot of droplets so that it can move into the vine quickly. Um, there is a little comment here around uh, fertility of adults may also be reduced. Um, so, you know, given that all the scale aren't at the same growth stage when we're spraying, we may be impacting a little bit on those um, females that are running a little bit behind. Um, just so just to go into this product a little bit more, um, it is slow acting um, compared to a neonicotide, which is a, a fast acting, we spray it, it will take a while. I think one of the most frustrating things in a vineyard is working out whether the scale is dead or alive. Um, so this is slow, it lasts in the vine. The good thing about it is when they hatch, those young uh, crawlers feed. So we're not relying so much on contact and good spray coverage to hit the insect. We're relying on the insect hatching and feeding. Um, so the thing that to think about with this product, which is I think what happens sometimes in the Adelaide Hills is that the, the ability of it to move through and its efficiency is really hindered with, dry peri with periods of cold, like we've got at the moment, if there's drought conditions so that that sap flow is reduced when the plant's not growing. So, you know, if we're spraying it out and there's not a lot happening in that plant, the um, the, the efficiency and effectiveness of that product is really going to be reduced. Um, once in, you can concentrate spray this, but I really think that we need to keep those water rates up to make sure we're, we're getting that product in. The other really critical thing around Movento is using the right adjuvant. Um, you can see here over on the right, without an adjuvant, the product really doesn't move in at all. So you need to make sure you follow label um, and use a really good um, adjuvant with it. They recommend Agridex and Hasten so that that product really gets into um, because we don't have a lot of opportunity to hit the insects because we've got a very small window. So we really need to make sure that we don't compromise what we're doing. Um, so the other thing is, I think, um, you know, in the industry, we're looking for a one hit wonder that we want to spray it this year and the problem goes away. I think we really need to look at this as a programmed approach that it's going to be a two or three year uh, window where we're slowly reducing that population and allowing um, the health of the vine to recover. Um, and, and it's not going to be we spray this year and the problem goes away. Um, it really needs to be you know, a long-term thought of managing our vineyards differently. Um, just to, sorry, I'm jumping around a bit. So what else, what are the other products um, that sort of are, are registered, I suppose? Obviously we do still have these, um, the, the um, again, a phosphates, the anticholesterol sort of group, really, you know, they're very broad spectrum. 
they're really not what we want to be using in our vineyards and I don't promote those. We've got these, um, the oils. I think there's still some interest around those and, and maybe better use of those. Um, you know, with discussion, there may be opportunity to use those, particularly if you're going into a replant situation and you're trying to control a mealybug or scale where you're grafting or going to top work. And I'll show you some info around that. Um, so there probably is some opportunity for that product, but it really, it's not, you know, the type of chemistry it is, um, we've got limited opportunity to use that in our vineyards and that's not something I'm, I'm recommending. And transform really where it fits, it, it is not an easy product to use either because of its grouping. So really, we, we really need to use those products that we do have, use them well. Um, so really what other options you know, I'm probably not giving you anything fantastically new here today, but it's really about trying to get clarity around what we're doing. So what are the other options? So ant control, um, I think that is an interesting option, maybe in some smaller vineyards. I think bigger vineyards, it's, it's difficult. And I think there's always that if we take out the ants, you know, what else are the ants doing for us? Um, uh, that's something we're looking at on trial work in a small way. Um, we've had lots of discussion around whether we can use um, mating disruptive pheromones. Um, they work really well in mealybugs, but unfortunately, scale don't need males. They're a part of that life cycle. So um, those pheromones obviously work on disrupting males. Um, scale just lay eggs. So that's not going to work. The beneficial insects, Paul's, Dr. Cooper's spoken about that. And that is really what we want to get back into our vineyards. We want to be seeing those wasps. We want to be seeing those holes drilled through. But for some reason, we are not getting that in our vineyards. So what we're now looking at, um, and I'll present a little bit about this, is impact of other pesticides or the sulfurs. What else we're using that may be impacting um, on the beneficials that we should have in the vineyard. So that's sort of where we're focusing a little bit of our research interest now. Um, we need to think about the environmental conditions. If it's going to be a wet year like we're getting now, humidity, um, the scale like dust, um, often scale are around, you know, where there's dust because beneficials obviously often don't like dust. Um, so the scale tend to breed up there. Um, we can talk about that in general discussion. Is there anything coming? Unfortunately, there's not a lot of um, chemistry coming. So we really need to think about what else we're doing in the vineyards to get this better. Um, you know, we've had discussions about neem and soaps, um, still not really um, probably at a commercial point yet. Interestingly, if you look overseas, they tend to use more soaps. Um, through winter and through the season for controlling soft scale and use the oils um, more on the armoured scale. So maybe there's a little bit of opportunity for research there. I use soaps on a trial basis quite late, but maybe we can um, look at that through winter or early in the growing season. So that's, you know, another opportunity for, for trial work. Um, I just said about beneficials, you know, way back in 2010, there was some work done, particularly around the mancozebs, but the, the impact of pesticides on the beneficials. And interestingly, the um, grain industry, GRDC, have just finished a major, um, I suppose, gap analysis into the impact of insecticides and miticides in the grain on beneficials and I think that's something we can probably piggyback on and have a look at that um, that was just completed this year to see really if there is something that we're doing in our vineyards that is you know making this problem worse for us so that's something I'm really keen to pursue more. Um, interestingly um, you know there was some work done from the Department of Agriculture and Water on a federal basis looking at the risk that scale have on an import base um, coming in on, on fruit and veg into our country on, on things being brought in. And if you're really interested in scale, look, this paper is um, very thorough in going through scale, scale biology. It's a great, great read if you're looking um, for, for something to read at night. Um, so, yeah, but, you know, I think scale are really coming to the forefront of risks to our industry. 
um, as I said, Paul, Dr. Cooper's spoken about this, but this is really what we'd love to see in our vineyards is more metaphycus, um, biological control. You know, we, we don't want to be spray, spraying more insecticides in our vineyards. Um, so this is really where we need to get to, um, or more of what uh, Dr. Cooper's talking about, you know, understanding the impact um, or other ways we can control them. This is what I'm mentioning before, you know, for samurai, but I think it's really unfortunate when we spend all this money grafting, top working and scale are in our vineyards. Um, whether there's virus on that vine or whether they're spreading it from other vines, you know, we're not giving those vines a good start when we start um, spending all this money and their, their scale already there. Um, viruses, this is leaf roll um, spread by scale. I can see the time is getting close. So I'm actually going to skip through this you very quickly so we can have a discussion. So virus is really coming to the fore in Australia in viticulture. And um, one of the main ways it's spread is through scale and mealybugs. So we really need to think of scale more outside of how we have that sooty mould to a whole vine health issue. Um, eggs, that's what you'll be seeing in the next um, couple of weeks. Um, so I'm really going to skip to the end here. Uh, you can see there might be some drag. Monitoring, um, get out in those vineyards, look for those mature females. Once they've hatched, the best thing I do is cut them, put them on a jar on your desk and you'll see when they hatch and that's a good indicator of when you should go out in the block and look. Um, ants, always look for ants. Um, they're a pretty good indicator that there's, there's some sort of scale or an insect um, associated with them. When you had bud burst, there might have been some patches that didn't burst as quickly. Often that is um, induced by scale that the bud burst of vines that are particularly infested will delay bud burst. Um, and this is sort of the size of what scale insects are compared to mealybug. Um, you will be able to see them once you get your eye in or take out a hand lens into the paddock. Um, so you know that target is really important. So I really skipped through pretty quickly, knowing your target, timing, when can we use these insecticides better? Um, you know, it's costly to get in a tractor and go out and spray. So we need to be doing it right. We need to make sure we're using the white water rates. Um, you may have to spray it as a dedicated spray to get that water rate correct. Thinking about the products we're using and then track it. Get out there and monitor and see, see what you've done. Um, Conclusion, you know, I think we know the impact they're having. We just need more information. I will have a disclaimer that, that, you know, I've spoken about some trial work that we're looking at doing and I'm thinking about doing. And I've also talked a little bit about products. You know, follow that up for yourself, for your own vineyards with whoever you supply your grapes to. Um, it's really important they are insecticides that we do this right and we follow the labels and do um, the you know, what you're growing in the end is a sellable product. So really, Robin, I have rushed through that pretty quickly because I think the, the discussion at the end is really vital. So we might, I might um, just leave my mic open now for discussion. Wonderful, thanks, Jenny. And I'd like to invite Paul to also join us for the Q&A session. Um, so we've got quite a few comments that have come through in the chat. Um, but I just had a question for you, Jenny, first um, about that applaud application. So you said that we might be able to start targeting or spraying the applaud earlier to affect the fertility of the young, um, the eggs that they're laying. So okay. the problem I think we've always had is, and that often happens with products, is we see a withholding period of EL25 for applaud, and we think we have to wait and spray it there. The label does say it's best on crawlers, um, but also there is probably an opportunity to look at that with the, the um, developer of that product and maybe hit, I have seen it work quite effectively in paddocks where we hit those females as they're growing through before they get that hard shell over them and impact the, the eggs that are laid. Mm. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Um, so to the chat room. Um, uh, so Jen, you spoke a little bit about the fact that we're not seeing um, the 
parasitic predation of the scale in the vineyard at this time. Um, we've got a question about, um, directed at Paul, whether you can make a comment about why we're not seeing that. Jen, I think you spoke about um, insecticides and miticides and the impact on that, but did you have anything to add to that um, topic, Paul? Hi. Mostly, it's really what you would have to say. It's anecdotal, but I believe it's the sulfur, um, which is maybe used, which limits the reproduction of this adult uh, parasites, parasitoids. Um, we need we, we don't have any good information on that, but in the local area um, where we have done a but you'd have to say a the viticulture has decreased sulfur use and we have increased had him buy in some ladybird beetles they're now not doing any spraying at all um, because between the ladybird beetles which will keep coming back as they are attracted to some of the volatiles that the plants putting out plus the fact that the parasitoids are decreasing the fecundity of the females um, by eating their way out. Um, it's minimized their costs um, in, in terms of overall chemical use. Mm -hmm. So, but, but there has been no study of, you know, whether or not it is sulfur. It's just kind of an anecdotal aspect of it. Um, um, he does different techniques for, they, they do different techniques then for controlling um, uh, mildew, because uh, powdery mildew obviously is what is being used. Um, and they're using the sulfur for, so um, I think that's one of the, the considerations and it may be something that Jenny wants to, to look into. Uh, certainly we are now going back and sort of reviewing um, and looking at, you know, we have changed our sulfur use practice. So what I'm doing at the moment is sort of, I'm looking at doing a bit of a gap analysis, I suppose, of what's changed in the last 20 years. Um, and certainly sulfur use is one of those that we've gone from quite low rates of sulfur um, to in some vineyards quite high. So that is one, um, but, you know, we're looking at all of those, you know, we use now a lot more sunscreens around those sort of kale and clays, which, you know, kale and clay in itself is are used overseas and is, as an insecticide because this, the ins beneficials tend to clean themselves a lot. So there might be an impact of that as well. I think we've changed a lot of um, things we do in the vineyard and we need to really take a step back and think about what we've changed. Our spray unit's very efficient now, but we're using high rates. It's a whole gamut has changed in the last 20 years. Mm. So I guess the risk of um, pulling sulfur out of the program is either it's going to increase the cost of the spray program if you start using biologicals um, in particular, or you're going to have to start using synthetics, which um, are costly and um, for organic growers is not an option. Um, any comments on that? Um, well, I think maybe, um, I, I think we can do it better and whether we can reduce back our sulfur a little bit, but I think there are benefits. There's always trade-offs with using other groups of chemistry. Um, and I think the cost of scale is quite significant. So I think we do need to reflect on um, where we're going, making sure, it's like I said, making sure we're using those five T's and targeting the the problem properly um, and that's probably something growers need to discuss with their individual wineries or suppliers. Mm. Um, I caught up with a grower yesterday in the Adelaide Hills who has dialed back the sulphur and is trialling a biological spray program and has a, a significant um, biodiversity planting within and around their vineyard and they um, commented that scale is not not a problem for them so mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess there are options, but you need to uh, look outside the square a bit. And also be patient. 
and be patient. Because yes. yeah. <laughs> it's not gonna, it may not happen the first year. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And I think um, even when you're using insecticides, Jen, that was your comment as well, that it's not going to happen in the first year, it may happen over a few years, you're gradually um, reducing the problem. Mm. Right, so we have got, oh, just a comment about Trevor uh, and a concern about the safety of that um, product or the impact of that product. Any thoughts on that, Jen? Uh, yeah, certainly, as I said, there are some um, uh, wine companies that won't allow Travor. It does have that group 4C, which is a neonicotide, and we know that that um, product is quite, um, you know, has an impact on honeybees. Um, so hence there are some, and that's why I say across all of this, make sure that you consult with whoever is buying your grapes because not all of these products are allowed. Uh, I think long-term, um, you know, the group, the neonicotinoids um, are not looked on favourably, particularly in Europe. So that's why I think we need to take a step back and really look at what we're doing because insecticides, we don't want insecticides to be the solution. Um, I think they, they're all impacting um, on our biodiversity in the vineyards. So really the product I presented are around a, a control for now, but I think long-term we, we need to find different solutions to what we're doing at the moment. Okay, good message. Uh, so James Gardner says, as a max, the active ingredient from neem will be registered for food crops next year. So definitely interested in looking at this with horticultural oils. Thank you, James. Um, oh, and then we've got a comment about egg laying started last week in Padthaway. Um, eggs observed in parts of Rattenbully this week. Lake pruning might be a complementary strategy to chemical treatments, extending the window available to us. And, you know, I think certainly this year we're, we're really noticing that, that it's a cold start to the season, so the, the growth isn't as fast as we get some years. So maybe there is a bigger window this year if you're noticing um, scale out there and... Um, you know, some sort of insecticide control is part of your strategic program in that maybe there is bigger, you know, some years we get uh, a very warm start where it's flowering before we know it. So maybe this year is an opportunity there for growers um, with the colder start. But that often then delays egg hatching as well, doesn't it, um, Paul, in terms of that the eggs, because it's cold, take longer to hatch. So um, it's a bit of a trade-off, the weather and the impact there on hatching. But it certainly would allow, if, if you can do more targeted pruning, um, to remove the problem before they even get started. So if, if you can and remove that's, the you know, we see in the, Yeah, and in the Adelaide Hills, you know, going to a lot more cane pruning, um, some of the Barossa going to cane pruning a lot more from spurs, the number of positions there for the scale is, is dramatically reduced because you're cutting them off and taking them out every year. So sometimes it is a mechanical solution rather than an insecticide. Maybe growing, you know, there's some work now around nitrogen that I'm looking into that maybe there's an impact on fertiliser, growing big canopies, the impact of nitrogen. Um, there is so much, um, you know, if I had another life, I could do a lot more work. Um, there is so much that we just don't know around why scale are there. You know, is it that those vineyards that we're trying to grow bigger tons, we're putting in more nitrogen, we're growing a bigger canopy, the scale, we love that. Is there an impact there around nutrition? You know, I think, Robin, the, the number of things we don't know compared to what we do know is, is immense. Well, this uh, Phil Riley says, is there any funding from levies in the pipeline to assist with your research? Did you plant that, that question in there, Jen? And no, I didn't. <laughs> Paul might have. Um, uh -huh. Look, I think, um, I think we have come to a point, and, and that's why I brought up what, you know, the GRDC have just done um, around you know, that was done sort of 10 years ago in, in grape and when we were grape and wine around even just looking at what's in the and whether they're having an impact, you know, 
could probably piggyback off what GRDC have just done because it is a significant survey of insecticides and impact on beneficials. So um, at the moment, there's not a lot, but that's not to say that the industry isn't keen to do some work. Uh, and John Baldwin has asked if the AWRI currently has any active research projects into this problem. We would love to, John, but no, we don't currently. Um, yeah, it's something that uh, yeah many people are, are working on and hoping to um, get some funding to do some, some research, um, but not at this stage. Um, what have we got? Uh, scale more or less prominent in different climates. Thanks, Lawrence. Um, I think um, Paul might be able to address this a little bit more. We did look originally around um, temperature and the impact of temperature and whether hot weather kills off scale, whether cold weather kills off scale. Um, I think that humidity, so that the what you see in scale is probably driven by weather a lot more. So regions like inland, riverland, um, still there and still causing us problems, but maybe not noticed as much because it's a dry finish and often that sooty mould that is a really strong indicator of scale being in the vineyards isn't seen compared to where we have more humid climates. But Paul, would you like to comment a little bit more on that as well? I don't know if there's any evidence that they're not in drier environments, because uh, I know um, when the first work was done, it was actually done uh, in Mildura, which I would consider to be a relatively dry environment. Um, but I think the thing is, is that the presence of sooty mold and the honeydew stays around longer in higher humidity conditions. So it becomes more obvious than in drier conditions. I think there's scales everywhere. Um, they're air blown. Um, one of the, so that in fact, the way they distribute themselves is they, the young, when you first, they first hatch, they run to the top of the plant and I can see this in the greenhouse quite easily. And the winds come up and they just carry it and they can be carried kilometers. I mean, we have no idea how far they can go. Um, they're little because they're shaped like this. So if you want to, they're, they're tiny little Frisbees that are sailing through the air and they randomly come down. And if they come down on a grapevine, well, that's fine. They can actually live on lots of other things too. But um, if they come down on a grapevines, once you have them into the field, then they can distribute themselves by running along the cordons and the um, uh, wires. So but they'll still distribute themselves further afield just by the wind. And, and as I mentioned, like I have had um, contact now out of Western Australia, which, you know, we thought um, I probably hadn't had a lot of inquiries out of Western Australia, but certainly now we're, we're finding that you know, mealybug was always quite dominant in Western Australia. But um, now that people are out there looking, um, they're certainly in Western Australia as well. Paul does most of his work on the Eastern seaboard. So, um, all through that Wagga, Canberra, Tumbarumba, all of there, um, South Australia, you know, the most regions um, I would get inquiries around what do we do when they're here. So um, I don't, I think they are across all regions. It's just the, the impact that they're having long term is still coming to the fore. Mm. Okay, um, so Stephen says that he um, is seeing scale on first year vines still in guards. So you talked a little bit about how they spread, but um, I, I'm imagining if, if there's a neighbouring vineyard with a scale problem, they could easily move on to that new vineyard. Do you have any other thoughts on how you could get scale in a, a new vineyard? I think the, the wind distri distribution is the most obvious one. So, um, I mean, that's one of the things is in the area I can, it's, it's really amazing when I find um, some places which don't have them, but it tends to be, if you look at the wind gradients, um, they tend to be in kind of a, a valley. So the wind actually goes above them. And so they get shifted into the next vineyard 
as opposed to landing in in the vineyard with, with, where they're minimi, minimal in terms of numbers. So I think the wind will is one of the major con considerations here, and and one of the limitations is right now we're seeing huge winds every year Spring. practically. Yeah, so keeping it down is going to be hard. Okay, we've got a comment from James Gardner again. So you can keep sulfur rates down and add ecocarb as a curative for powdery control. Great combination. And then down below, he says, keep sulfur rates to lower label rates as sulfur toxicity to beneficials has been shown by Caesar's work to be additive during the season. Use lower label rates of eco carbs, so 300 grams per 100 litres. Is that something that you've trialled, Jen? Oh, look, I think, um, you know, I'm, as I said, I'm not here to give um, agronomic advice as how you should spray um, because the last thing we want is uh, powdery mildew through everyone's vineyards. But I think if we look at what we used to do 15, 20 years ago, um, uh, we used to use probably two to three kilos of sulfur a hectare. Um, and now, you know, we've got vineyards that are up at six and seven. Um, but, you know, in saying that, maybe the, the acceptability of how much powdery we could have in our vineyard 20 years ago was slightly different. We had less vineyards. So I, I think that is something that we probably really need to, each grower needs to look at their canopy size their density, their risks. Um, I'm not willing to sort of say you should only use um, because that really comes down to each paddock and their risk and, you know, their, their style, how good their coverage is. It's great to say we'll only use three kilos, but if you don't have a good spray cart and your coverage isn't great, well, are you going to, is that going to be enough? So I think that is really a decision for growers to make, um, not for me to make for them. Okay, thank you. So Greg has a question. Has there been any research on the resultant sooty mould from scale regarding quality in white wine? Uh, yeah, we did a um, trial um, funded to some degree by Lang Concrete Grape Growers of the Central Region and AWRI. Um, we were a great partner in that for us, uh, where they came and made, they did small lot trials of 50 litres, I think it was, um, and made wine of both Chardonnay and Shiraz. So we went out and specifically picked uh, bunches that covered in sooty mould and ones that were definitely clean they didn't have botrytis we we did a major amount of work they awr I did for us there and made um, small lots and accompanying that we made commercial lots where we made um, one ton lots um, from two vineyards in Langhorn Creek with and without scale Chardonnay and Shiraz Look, the outcome of that probably from the AWR's point of view was we kept those for 18 months, I think, and we looked at whether there was decline in flavour and, and that went through a tasting panel. Um, you know, the outcome, I think, was that they couldn't see a significance, but when you tasted it, we, we did put that a little bit to the, to the um, winemakers, I suppose. There seemed to be a flatness, um, but certainly the Peer fruit that is covered in sooty mould, um, you know, I, I just think it, it makes extra work. Um, so I suppose that was to somewhat inconclusive um, in that we have done some of that work. Um, there didn't seem to be a big impact, but on a commercial basis, is a big winery going to want to deal with that? Great, thank you. Uh, so we've got Daniel. The commercial reality for grape growers is that if a grape buyer can show greater than generally five to six percent incidence of any mold taint, this allows for contractual contractual rejection. For less incidence, the grower may get hit with a downgrade and financial penalty, as fruit pricing takes downward pressure from negative market forces in some districts and price points, the control programs for growers must be effective and affordable whilst being environmentally acceptable. It's a tough ask. This is a timely webinar. Great to see everyone getting interested. Thank you, Daniel. 
So I think I'm sh still um, sharing my screen and you can yeah, see you those Sauvignon Blanc there. Um, and it's interesting that um, Paul's done some of his work. You know, if you're a buyer and you've got that compared to clean fruit, mm. regardless of what we know about fruit quality, mm. which one are you going to buy? Mm. Yeah, okay. Uh, so we don't have any more questions, but Paul, I did have a question for you. So it was more um, to try and get clarity on some of the results that you presented. So for Cab Sav, um, you showed that um, the vine produced a volatile compound in response to the scale infestation. And that volatile compound then resulted in a reddening of the leaves um, of the Shiraz. But the Shiraz itself didn't... Doesn't do it. ...produce the volatile compounds itself. No, it's something and different between the... Uh, so mm -hmm. it appears to be that Pinot Noir and Cabernet Sauvignon can produce this volatile. Um, and... and we don't know what it is, and that's what we're trying to figure out is what that can be. Because this anthocyanin, which is normally made in the leaf in most diseases, is clearly being transferred into those leaves along the petiole from some distal area. And we don't even know where that is. Mm -hmm. um, and luckily I have we have one person here at the who's really good at understanding anthocyanin transport um, at the ANU. So that's why we're redoing that experiment again to see if we can determine where the location is. It could even be from the roots, mm. um, uh, but it is a very interesting response. Mm. So um, you're saying the results showed that the scale didn't like, like that and so moved away from those leaves. On Cabernet. On oh, Cabernet. sorry, on Cabernet. But not on um, Shiraz. So when the leaves get dropped, mm. The scales all disappear. <laughs> so, so that happens, doesn't it, Paul, in Pinot Noir? Is that yeah, the, the vines tend to too. drop if they get scale, they, they drop they those drop basal leaves. leaves. So and it's we think natural. that and this yeah, and the second part of that is we think what's happening. <laughs> we think what's happening is in fact the um, sugars um, are being moved differently. Am I muted now? Um, so that it's attracting on, on Cabernet, it's attracting the scales onto the green leaves, but in Sh Shiraz, they don't have the capacity to have that change in sugar movement. So the insects are staying on the red leaves um, until they drop off. Hmm. So, and that's one of the things we need to figure, figure out because, and that, that is something that a mechanism that if we can figure out is just using the material that's already present within the leaves um, of vitus, nice thing, it's all the same plant, to initiate their own control of their own scales. Hmm. Genius, love it. <laughs> so that, and that, that, that was the whole, well, that was why when, when we got the result with Sauvignon Blanc about the growth, that immediately said that in fact there are things that the plants can do differentially, um, just being cultivars which have been raised as separate uh, plants basically for thousands of years, um, and they've developed these special specialties, mm -hmm. and so it would be good to to be able to find out what that anthocyanin is, because if we can, that will give Shiraz that aspect of, of control or protection that it currently doesn't have. What we don't know is whether grafting will do. Um, and, and that's one of the things that we'd like to follow up is to see if you can actually graft. Um, again, the nice thing is Vitus is, is well graft, easily to graft. Um, so that Shiraz, which is grafted under onto either Pinot Noir or the uh, Cabernet Sauvignon rootstock would take on those characteristics. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm not too confident in that um, because the leaves don't necessarily reflect um, what the rootstock is. And we know that from all graftings is that um, the, the, the fruit tends to stay the same um, if, even if it's grafted under different rootstock. Mm. Okay. Uh, so <laughs> Stephen has said, Paul, your work showed Shiraz are susceptible and dropping leaves, although we are seeing higher incidence and severity on this variety. Well, that's, that, that's the normal thing. That's what susceptible means, is it tends to have lots of scales. So, and, and Paul, I think to clarify, you were saying that it doesn't drop its leaves as quickly as a pinot would, no, but it no. tends to hold those leaves. They turn red, but it yep. holds those leaves a lot longer. So the scale are then moving around. Well, they're not moving off those under green like they're, they're not in Cabernet, but, but they're staying there. But that's also in a closed environment. Yes. So we won't see that in the field because mm. normally they're not, um, next they're not growing other. next to each other, are they? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so yeah. there's no way you're actually going to see that in the field yeah. until you get to a point where you can actually get Shiraz to show that same response that Cabernet and Pinot do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. Uh, so Phil has asked, are all grape growing areas in Australia affected by scale? And what is the impact on table grapes? Um, so table grapes um, are a whole new ball game, as we all know, and the ability to spray in table grapes is quite different from what we can do in wine grapes. Um, so it's we, as I said earlier, we know from Western Australia across to the Eastern Seaboard, there are scale in vineyards. Um, there are scale in table grapes vineyards there's you know incredible problems with mealybug as well but their ability to control them is quite significantly different from what we can do in wine grapes i'll probably leave it at that paul anything but i you know it, well, it, it's different uh, well that's where buchanan first showed you know that's where he was interested was in mildura um with the table grapes so and then that spread out from there so that would be my guess is that um uh, it's it's pretty common across. It's it, they're they're found. These are these are actually not initially grapevine scales. These are stone fruit was what was what the grapevine scale came in on, and uh, the frosted scale came in on oranges. I think um, I'd have to go back and check that. But the history is that they're they they've just moved on to grapes, um, although. Um, so what we find here in Australia may not be the same scales which are found overseas. Mm, okay. Uh, so I'm interested in the ladybird beetles and the compound that is produced, which attracts... Nananol. 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 Uh, N-O-N-A-N-O-L. So... Can we just spray that out on our vineyards? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, 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 it is, it is, um, it's an attractant, but it's also um, a pheromone. Um, so you may get more than just ladybird beetles coming in. <laughs> um, so it's, it's known to be um, uh, an attractant for many different type of insects. Mm. Um, Interesting. So, Jen, you spoke about pheromones not being um, uh, suitable to use in scale because they're tricky little beasts that don't need males, but perhaps it's the pheromones of ladybird beetles that we need to put out to attract the ladybirds to increase the production. Yeah, you know, I think that's the thing. You know, I think we, that's what I keep saying, we need to look outside the square of mm -hmm. what we're currently doing mm -hmm. and see, you know, we, I suppose in Lang Concrete, we went through the elephant weevil phase where, you know, vines in decline certainly emit chemicals and say that they're stressed and then we get elephant weevil coming in and, you know, there's a whole interaction out there happening in the vineyards that we mm. need to better understand around yeah. beneficial insects, um, scales, insects, mealybug, um, mm. 
and I think often we change something, you know, we did it with Mankazeb that we thought that was really bad for our beneficials. So we took it out and we ended up with Phomopsis because we didn't know that Mankazeb was doing such a great job controlling Phomopsis. So, you know, it, it is a really integrated network out in the vineyards. And I think, you know, that's why I'm saying if we, if we go and bait ants and get rid of all the ants, are those ants doing something else for us that we yes, don't realise? <laughs> you know, that's the thing. So I think, you know, we need to be careful around understanding and, and there's so much that can be done to sort of get the balance right. Mm -hmm. um, there's one thing that I'm quite interested in and it's um, related to organic vineyards. So in um, New Zealand, in Hawke's Bay, Villa Maria is an organic um, vineyard there. They're surrounded by conventional vineyards um, and mealybug uh, was a huge issue um, back 10 years ago um, and, and um, leaf roll virus as well as a result. But Villa Maria was this little patch in the middle of this patchwork quilt of conventional um, vineyards. And the um, mealybug numbers were, they weren't spraying insecticides, but their mealybug numbers were lower. And uh, the wonderful Vaughan Bell over there um, has uh, a heap of information about um, plant species that the mealybug preferred mm. to hang out on. And the theory was that the um, organic vineyards, because they didn't use herbicides, they had a whole heap of other plants that were actually um, preferable um, hosts for the mealybug. Is that something that could be um, used to our advantage to control scale here? Paul might speak first. Yeah, well, I think I think that's it's it's a little bit harder to know about that, but I would say that the advantage of having the reservoirs um, of plants is one of the things where I think the uh, parasitoids are present because the parasitoids are. I mean, they came back in fairly quickly after the sulfur was decreased. Now that meant that they were using some other insect um, as a host in the period of time when they weren't actually mm -hmm. um, present on the scales. Um, and so the, that um, diversity of plants would be a host where another insect could be that the parasitoids were utilizing and then when it became easier to get all these scales, they moved on to that very, very rapidly because it went from a load, parasitoid load of around 10% up to 80% very quickly in the population. So that to me immediately said that by not using herbicides, there was an advantage there. Mm. Mm, wonderful. Love that message. Um, so Stephen has said, are our source blocks of certified planting material at fundamental risk of viral infection due to scale? Are the vine improvement associations taking any preventative action? Uh, so there is a uh, Wine Australia project um, uh, that is, I believe it's started. Um, it's the germplasm um, project, the National Germplasm Project, um, that is really looking at safeguarding um, planting material. I spoke to one of the main um, nurseries on Tuesday, and they are establishing a, a new source block um, that is um, away from all other, other vineyards. They're making sure that every single vine is virus free. There's a 200 kilometer radius around it um, to protect it from the movement of mealybug and scale into that vineyard. So um, things are happening in that space. Stephen, is there anything you want to add, Jenny or Paul? Uh, yeah, look, I think, um... We, it is changing. I think um, probably 
in the past and, um, you know, I'm not sure how many paddocks, um, you know, our source blocks are interplanted. Um, so there is certainly a push and there's some new information coming out for nurseries with new documentation around vine health, um, keeping vineyards clean. Um, I think we're only starting to really realise the impact that scale and mealybug are having on virus spread. Um, and that is probably the shift in this discussion has gone through from uh, scale and mealybug are causing me a problem at vintage and I can't pick my grapes to scale and mealybug are, are major vectors in the spread of virus and virus is uh, on the increase, the knowledge around virus and the impact that virus are going to have in the future um, has really shifted the discussion around vine health as a total um, industry problem. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Jen. Uh, anything to add, Paul? Uh, no, I, <laughs> I'm not even sure what viruses the scales carry, to be honest. So I think we'd have to even do that kind of work. Yeah. Um, right. I don't think we've got any more questions. Oh, here we go. Thanks, guys. A great session and moving in the right direction. Thank you, Phil. Um, and thank you to Jenny and Paul as well. So if you are interested in biological control of uh, botrytis, botrytis, we have a webinar tomorrow. Um, if you want to register for the webinar, jump onto the AWRI website um, and join us tomorrow. Uh, thank you very much, Jen and Paul. What a great informative um, webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you next time. <laughs>